Thank you. I've still got my training wheels on today. <laughs> So I think to start off with, we'll just do a round of um, introductions on who's in our team and what our roles are. So, Carol? Oh, kia ora. I'm the program manager for the Bell Screening Program. Um, a lot of you will know me, and um, thanks for coming. Yeah. Kia ora, everybody. The, I'm the communications lead and pro project support for the Northland Bell Screening Program, Lorraine Stewart. Jara uh, and Stuart Selke Dene. Um, I'm the health promotion lead for the program, um, and hopefully I will be able to get around to see you guys with Jess some stage. That's me, the handsome fellow on the left, <laughs> the one on the right. Kia Tato. My name's Deandra. I'm the clinical nurse specialist for the bowel screening program. And um, Kia ora, Jess Brown, um, the primary care liaison nurse, and. Um, some of you I will have already met in my travels coming out to see you um, and yeah probably see more of me along the way as well. Um, so first of all we have passed our Ministry of Health readiness assessment that's been quite a gruelling process um, having to meet all the requirements in order for our program to be um, able to go live. And yeah, we have had some hiccups along the way and the date's been pushed out, but we've got a go live date now for the 2nd of November. Um, so we're eagerly anticipating that now. And I do apologise if some of you have zoomed in before, um, some of this will be a little bit repetitive, but we just want to um, kind of give an update of where we're at at the moment. So um, as you can see there, um, we've got one of the highest bowel cancer mortality rates, um, six highest for men and third highest for women. And um, we know with bowel screening that the earlier bowel cancer is diagnosed, they've got a better chance of survival. And it's the second most common cause of cancer death in New Zealand. Um, there's a few numbers up there. So in Northland, in the first two-year cycle, <clears throat> we've got um, an estimated 36,000 participants. So that will be um, 18,000 participants in each year of that cycle. Um, and those rates down the bottom there are what's current off the shiny apps um, that's showing what it looks like around the rest of the country for participation. So obviously our Māori and Pacific Island um, communities are most represented there in terms of access and participation. So that's something we wholeheartedly want to try and um, address along the way. Um, in the first year in Northland for the first 18,000 people, we're um, sort of estimating based on other areas that we might detect 44 cancers. So it's super important. Um, yeah, just talks there a little bit about um, that bowel cancer um, kills as many New Zealanders as breast and prostate cancer combined. It does affect people at any age. Um, obviously, the earlier that it's treated and or screened and treated, um, the better. The program is aimed at ages 60 to 74, and that captures sort of, if you think of a bell-shaped curve, it kind of captures the majority of those cases that we see. Um, yeah, it's a two-year cycle, and the invitations get sent directly to the patients, and that's um, initiated at the National Coordination Centre, and those details are gathered between the NHI register and the NES register, so um, that's where they get the details from. The other DHBs across New Zealand have gone live. There's just us and Bay Plenty <clears throat> um, who will go live after us. So we're the tailing Charlies. 
and yeah, so the participants will get sent an invitation letter and a test kit around their birthday. So the first year it's people with even birthdays and the second year people with odd birthdays. Um, they do the sample at home. It's supposed to be something that they can do cleanly and pop it in the post. And then um, it gets processed through the Auckland laboratory at this point. And then the results will get sent back to the patients if they're negative or back to the GPs if they're positive. Mm. Um, and then it's up to the GP or practice the medical centres to uh, refer back in for colonoscopy for those that need further investigation. Mm. And some of those that won't be appropriate for colonoscopy so they can have a CTC. Um, that's a picture of our pathway. It's quite difficult to read, but it just kind of breaks down um, the big picture about the whole process. Um, there is a primary care provider's guide, which I'll talk about shortly, but this is in there as well, so you can have a good look at it um, when you have a look at the guide. That's the guide there. Um, so that's been finalised, and we're just in the process of hopefully getting it put on the Mahitahi website, or it, you might, it might be on the DHB one yet. We're just working that out. Um, but regardless, you can get in touch with me and I can flip one out on the email. Um, it's got kind of, it's kind of your how-to guide. It's got everything in there and some frequently asked questions. It kind of breaks down what you can expect to see and why we are doing things the way we are. Um, equally, you can just pop some feedback at the end of the presentation and I can get those out to you as well. Uh, we've got our health pathways up, so this is what it looks like. So if you just take notice on the left there, it's under surgical, um, which might not be your first place to look. Um, and then under the colorectal surgery and then bowel cancer, and we sit down in there. So um, that will also give you some information around um, the purposes as well. And um, in my travels so far, when I've been talking to um, primary care, there has been a little bit of concern around, um, you know, the workload that this might present. And looking at other DHBs, and that going back to that projection of 44 cases in the first year, there's around 41 practices in Northland. So it works out one positive cancer per year per practice. So I, yeah, I think it's, definitely doable. Um, for us here at the DHB, it means another five or 600 colonoscopies on top of what we are doing. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit extra, but um, in the role of primary care, so I think it's really good if you guys can encourage and support people to participate in the program. Um, I'm pretty certain that they're going to come with questions about it. Um, and Obviously, another part of your role will be giving those positive results. Mm -hmm. So the GPs, the nurses and nurse practitioners can give those results. And um, it can be, you might invite them in and tell them in person, or it might be something you do over the phone. Um, it's come back to the GPs to do that part, mainly because you guys know your patients and they trust you. And I think if they are getting a positive fit test, that could be quite worrying for some, and it's really important mm -hmm. to reassure them that it doesn't mean they have cancer, it just means they need some more investigation. Um, and then um, obviously referring back in to us if they need the colonoscopies done. Also your dashboards would have changed and I'll show you a slide of that um, shortly as well. But just checking those screening statuses for your people between 60 and 74 and just having the corridor about, um, you know, maybe why they haven't returned a kit or if they lost it. Um, there's also an option on there which I'll show you where you can request another kit. I'll hand over to Carolyn just to talk briefly about the equity focus. Yeah, um, so we've been working on this program for about 18 months, uh, two years um, so far in Northland. And um, one of our biggest focuses has been equity. So we've set up um, an equity group last year, which is was composed, comprised of um, a whole lot of people from the governance group and, um, and a Pacific person as well. So 
on, you can see up there on the slide who we've had on the governance group. So all of those people sat on our equity group and we developed an equity plan, which is, um, is all very well developing a plan, but we've also um, started to, to actually do the work on the ground. So um, Dr. Moya Nimo, a surgical registrar last year did a series of hui around the North. And uh, she talked to a lot of kuia and kamatu about um, what, what would work for bowel screening for Māori in Northland. And that's been really helpful to inform us of um, our mahi going forward in this area. Um, Pacific are one of the, we know that Pacific are one of the lowest participant, um, participation rates in the, across the country. And we'd like to make sure that our Pacific rates are, um, and Māori rates are either equal to or above non-Māori. Mm. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we've, we've got um, Stu, who I'll just get to talk in a second, but we're offering colonoscopies both in Kaitai and Whanganui because we know there's a, a greater uh, area of need up in the north and more Māori and Pacific right up in the far north. And also there's a, a national network, um, national Māori and a national Pacific network Mm -hmm. for bowel screening and they meet regularly and do a lot of work around, they've been working on the lowering of the age range and that's been a national push to lower that age range to 50. At the moment that's not happening um, until all of the until all of the DHBs go live. So that'll be early next year I think that work will start um, ramping up and that of course has to go through Treasury and Cabinet. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Stu's going, going to be doing a lot, is doing a lot of work with Māori groups and um, do you want to have a quick word sure. about what you're working with Māori, um, yeah. Stu? So, kia ora no. um, So, for, for Māori, there's always going to be this barrier of um, getting a fecal sample for starters mm. and then actually putting it in the post to send off for um, for testing and you know that our whole program relies on this so it's a matter of having this corridor mm -hmm. to, to with, with relative groups that that it applies to to encourage them that you know this is a, a way that early detection can be made mm -hmm. so the more that is that it's um that is actually accepted the more that it will be done what we don't want is for our maori and this applies to everybody actually what we don't want is for mm. these kits to be sent out um the particip participants just look at it don't understand it put it on the shelf and it just sits there mm. it doesn't help anybody so the encouragement is to talk to um particularly for our maoris and i'm not doing this on my own i'm doing this with our uh, collaboration with our maori providers and um uh, service groups, anyone um, that um, who who can who have an interest in, in better health, uh, I'm happy to work with. But at the moment, well, I've, I've been around to speak with the providers, and I will. That's for an initial visit, and I will follow up again uh, closer to going live on the second of November. But uh, we are very aware that you are all very busy with COVID vaccinations, and we are we do not want to come at a time when you are uh, extra busy. So we're hoping that the need for COVID will lessen and then we can um, concentrate a bit more on other programs, which we hope is ours. <laughs> so that's pretty much our mahi with, um, with our Māori providers. With um, the Runanga, I've been talking with them as well to get information on their pages. It's just that the more information that, that we can get out, um, the more opportunity we have for our Māori people in particular to see it. Um, but it's not just Māori, we have Pacifica, we have the, um, the, the disabled, we have very good communication with the disabled community, We've got really good people in Whangarei we're working with who represent the whole of Northland. So um, we really do have, we're hoping to have a lot of those areas covered. So pretty much us, we have, um, we're getting a little tool to help us promote this bowel screening program. It's an uh, inflatable bowel, which um, measures six meters by four meters wide and two meters high. It's inflatable. You blow it up. You can actually walk through it. And it's got 
you, it represents a bowel which has got polyps sticking out of it and whatnot and whatnot. These, which we, we will bring around to um, events um, to, to promote the program. And really, this is, um, we want this to encourage conversation because some people are going to look at it and perhaps feel a little bit um, anti about having it wherever it's going to be. But if it promotes conversation, that's what we're after. Mm -hmm. So, and we can bring it, look, if, if any of you, people out there in, in, um, in the practices have groups that you would you think may um, benefit from having Jess or I to come along and, and coordinate it all to them, please let Jess know or myself know. We'll be more than happy to do that. Kia ora. Um, I'll just touch on the role of the National Coordination Centre. So that's the start of the process. Um, they send out the invitations. They advise the participants if their fit tests are negative. They will also contact the non-responders, so people that haven't sent their kits back in, um, and that will be focused on the target groups, which are Māori Pacific Island and those people in areas of deprivation 9 and 10 um, within the eight weeks. And so they make a few attempts at calling them and then they refer to our um, local DHB outreach services. And it might be at that point that they get in touch with you guys as well, just to try and work um, together to, to get hold of these people and see if we can get them engaged. Um, yeah, I'll pass over to Deandra. Um, this slide, um, I'm sure uh, we all know, uh, but we'll just touch on, um, you know, with early stage bowel cancer, there may be no symptoms um, or bleeding. Common signs and symptoms of bowel cancer may include bleeding from the bottom, change of bowel motions or habits that come and go over several weeks, not just several days, anemia, severe persistent or periodic uh, abdominal pain, a lump or mass in the abdomen, um, unintentional weight loss and tiredness for no obvious reason. So uh, screening is for people who are asymptomatic, not symptomatic. And this is also on the FIT test. It does say the FIT test, uh, not if you're symptomatic, please do not do the test. Uh, go to and see your GP. However, we know people don't read the test and, and they still do it, that's fine. Um, but if they are symptomatic, um, please refer these people on for a colonoscopy through the normal ch channels. They do not need to do the screening test. So um, we all know there's an increased risk due to family history and a big part of the bowel screening is asking the questions. Uh, so that starts right back at the GP. So um, when you do the referral, that, that those questions have been asked. Um, if there is a, a concern or a high risk, uh, do refer these patients on to the New Zealand Familial GI Cancer Service. Um, also, as uh, part of my role, I do the pre-assessment. It's quite a, a very comprehensive uh, pre-assessment in that we formulate management of certain patients with diabetes, anticoagulation, medication, and so on. Um, and in that pre-assessment, I do a thorough uh, family history again, and we will refer at that stage. So it may be that they may not have disclosed to you or couldn't remember, but by asking several times that it may, may jog their memory. So I ask it, and then at the colonoscopy, uh, it is also reported uh, on their probation report after their colonoscopy. So yeah, family history is very important in our bowel screening program. Uh, and I'll just touch on the um, fit test seen outside of the bowel screening program. So some people have asked about kits that can be purchased at the pharmacy. Uh, it's not, those are not approved by the Ministry of Health and unfortunately wouldn't fall under the National Bowel Screening Program. So if a patient chooses to purchase one of those, um, they don't receive a fund, funded colonoscopy through the program. They would be asked to complete um, one of the um, National Bowel Screening Program fit kits um, and have that result processed through the normal channels. Uh, that's what the results will look like when they come into your doctor's inboxes. So um, you'll get the negative ones as well for filing, but you don't need to notify the patients about those. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see on there it says, please discuss this result with your patient and refer for colonoscopy within 10 days. Um, so we have a bowel screening register 
and um, Deandra and I will be keeping an eye on it at this end as well. And anybody that kind of falls outside that, you'll probably get a phone call from us um, just to see what's happening with that as well. Uh, so that's the updated dashboard. Uh, so it looks a little bit similar to your cervical screening and smoking cessation type things. Um, where they are due and they haven't returned a kit or they're due and maybe haven't received one, you can click on the green light there and the um, advanced form will pop up, a little bit like the smoking cessation. Uh, when you tick that, please send a test kit at the top of the list there. It automatically generates one from the National Coordination Centre, which gets sent straight out to the patient. So that's really cool and simple to use. So um, the other thing is our priority group, so Māori Pacific Island and High Dep. Uh, we can be ticking that and ordering one at the start of the two-year cycle. If their birthday falls near the end and you think, actually, they're over 60, let's just get it done you can click that and they'll get sent one early as well. So, um, but just that's just for our Māori Pacific Island and high debt um, population. Uh, so that positive fit test when it comes in, you've got the 10 days um, to let the patient know and then refer in and into the DHP. So that first initial positive result does not mean they've got cancer and about 7% of those will come back uh, requiring referral for colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. And then what they've found is another 7 or 8% of those mm -hmm. are the ones that have been positive for cancer. So that's our 44 in our first year of 18,000 participants. That's that number. Um, and we would love if you could send the e-referral um, for all positive ones, even if the patient decides to decline a colonoscopy mm -hmm. or they want to go private. Um, please still send that referral just with that information for us so we can update our register. In the event that they do decline, uh, they will be recalled again on the next two-year cycle and that will continue right through the program. Um, yep, so that's um, still important. And yep, that referral form's been um, made live now, I think. Yeah, it was on the 28th. So, um, it's a really simple form. It sits in the health link below the other colonoscopy for symptomatic patients, but it will say colonoscopy bowel screening program. Um, and it's got drop down boxes. It covers the list there on the slide. Um, so it's designed to be super easy to use and the nurses can do them as well. Um, yeah, just important to get those into us. Um, for those referrals, the general practices get reimbursed um, $60 plus GST. That's including the ones where patients decline or want to go private. Um, and there's no invoicing involved um, for reimbursement. That gets generated when the e-referral sends and Mahitahi pays that back at the end of the month as a bulk um, payment to each practice. Um, it's preferable, well, it's a necessity, please. We don't charge the patients for any of it. Um, we want them to um, feel like they are engaging in a free program. So, um, yeah, I think I've covered the rest of that one. Um, and so this is what they get as their, part of their pre-invitation, so or their invitation um, prior to them receiving the kit. There will be some information there about who's eligible to do the test, how to do the test, who shouldn't do the test, talks about negative and positive results and where they can go to get more information. Yeah. Can I just jump on to the next one? Yeah, that's what the sample um, looks like that they get sent. Mm. Okay, so yeah, after they get the initial invite, uh, two weeks later they'll get the fit test um, in the mail. And I don't know if you see that, but um, it's a it's a return envelope, and in it is the fit test um, information um, and a disposable paper that goes in the toilet. I uh, don't need to explain more there. And a consent form. And the consent form is really important. They don't have to sign the consent form, but there's a couple of key things to uh, to reduce the amount of spoiled kit tests. So the, the participant needs to, um, or the person needs to write the date on. And that's because 
uh, if it's received after eight days, they can't test it. Uh, so that's the majority of their uh, fit test. So if, if it's a sport kit test, the NCC will send out another one. They'll send out as many as need be, but uh, educating the people, uh, people to do it, you know, just put the date on, um, peel off the barcode, that's another important one, um, and pop it on the flat side of the tube. And also just check, we, we just get them to check their GP details are correct and add or delete as necessary. So it's not like uh, the FOBT where it's a scoop. Um, this one is just uh, basically, it's more specific, um, more sensitive, sorry, as well, uh, to human blood, uh, picking up human blood. So it is just a, a matchstick size that they need. We ask them to do it also early in the um, week rather than uh, late in the week, just for the postal uh, delays. So once they do it, um, they pop it in a clear plastic bag and then in the return envelope. And um, these instructions do come in 10 different languages. So uh, we can send out, National Coordination Centre can send out uh, several different languages. Um, we also understand that uh, for some people, uh, they may not want to send this in the post. Um, you know, it's species, it's doing in the post, whakama. So we have uh, arranged uh, drop-off points along the way around Northland. Uh, and we are also engaging with other, um, for example, district nurses and other practices to possibly, you know, whilst you're visiting the, uh, think, thank you, <laughs> whilst you're visiting the uh, patient or person, um, you know, if they don't have transportation means, then pick it up and post it for them. So that's, that's kind of how we're trying to make it a more equitable program for, for, for everyone. So these are the drop-off points here, as you can read there. Yes, yeah, so we have organised, sorry, yeah, no. we have organised with Northern Pathology that the, the people can take their samples and drop them in if they're going for a blood test or something like that, or it's just a little bit more um, less obvious than popping an envelope in the post box. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're happy to collect them. The samples don't go with their lab samples though, they will literally put them in the post box. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, if we can all be talking to our sort of wider health professional community, our Kaiafina and our district nurses and, and those kind of people, if they're in the homes, then they can equally take them and pop them in the post as well. So we're just mm -hmm. trying to make it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. And I'll pop you back to Dee to talk about the um, colonoscopy unit. All right, yeah, so the role of, of the DHV here. So um, if there is no referral by day 10 uh, for a participant with a positive result, then um, part of my role is to contact uh, you guys, the, the general practice, just to request that referrals done. Um, obviously, um, we will work with the general practice Māori health providers to reach participants if, if we're unable to contact. What was that about? Sorry, I didn't just read that. All uh, oh, right, okay, this is if we can't contact. I think we've touched on this yeah. before. So um, if the National Coordination Centre, the GP practice or myself have no luck or the DHB, no luck with reaching the participant, uh, we do send uh, out a discharge letter. So we will uh, close that on the bowel screening register, but um, as Jeff pointed out before, they will get recalled um, after two years. And sometimes participants or people just don't want to engage and, and that's fine. They do have the option they can write in to opt out altogether, but they, if, if they declined or they can't be reached, they will get recalled again in two years. And we'll make every attempt to, as a DHB, to try and engage with, uh, with the people. Okay, so um, yeah, so my role is a um, pre-assessment and most of them will be done over the phone. So I, I, we, we, I do this assessment, it's about half an hour. And um, from that, I formulate with our clinical lead um, a plan, particularly for people on anticoagulation, um, diabetic medication, um, also people with uh, complex needs such as renal or cardiac issues and we formulate a plan. So it's all uh, about keeping um, our people safe or people that are usually well who we've invited on for a colonoscopy. So 
it, it's a, it's a, we, we do every measure to try and keep people safe and, and have a good, clear management plan for these people. And also identify any issues with transport, translation services, et cetera. So um, we do offer the, um, them a colonoscopy and it has to be within the 45 days, uh, working days from the positive result. So it, we always offer them the first colonoscopy date. They may decline, um, but we give them the choice to try and reduce that DNA. And as Carolyn pointed out, uh, we do offer colonoscopies in Kaitai and Whangarei. Uh, we do have that CTC uh, option for, for people who it's not suitable and um, you may request that um, and our clinical lead will look at that and, and decide whether they go through for a CTC or colonoscopy. Um, if the colonoscopy is negative um, or uh, low suspicion uh, polyps, they will return to the screening program after five years um, unless they're referred for ongoing surveillance. If they've picked up some polyps that are a little bit suspicious, they'll call them back in a year or um, up, up to the uh, clinical lead, depending on their histology result. Thank you. That's our um, inflatable bowel there in the picture, Tinker Bell. I'll just um, pass you over to Lorraine to talk a little bit about the communication side of things. Kia ora everybody. Um, so currently organised is advertisements to go out in our local newspapers. I think we've got seven local newspapers, Rainbow News, Cultural Life of Stala, Northern News, etc. The first ad that will feature is on the 21st of October um, and the next lot start a week after that. It's just the fortnightly timing of the papers and nine or ten of the local radio stations as well. Um, we have pre-recorded ads that are featuring on those a couple of weeks before the program and a couple of weeks after. So if you listen out for those, let us know if you hear them, what you think. Um, we're also creating billboards at the moment. And they will go up just be after go live on the 2nd of November. And social media tiles, um, a couple of the radio stations have offered to feature them. They'll go on the DHB. Um, Facebook page, we'll contact Mahitahi as well to see if they can go up there. Um, there will be ads on our DHB website and um, I'll leave it to Stu to talk about, to talk about the champions. We're engaging yeah. local um, champions to feature in interviews and ads as well. Yeah, sorry, I, I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, we will have a, um, quite a number of local champions, which we hope to cover uh, who we hope to represent right around um, Northland. So we'll, we'll have someone in Davil, our very own Matua Rex Nathan, who's well famous over there, but similar people of his ilk with the, around the area so that the, it becomes a, a regional program of Taitokero, not just centred about any one or two people. We're, we're finalising those, um, those champions and we'll begin to... Um, do the videos in the next couple of weeks. So we're hoping to have this ready by Go Live Day in the 2nd of November. They will be available if you wish to have them in your uh, waiting rooms, which they can just uh, roll over uh, however you do it. But we will ensure that you, you do have access to these so that they can be played in, in wherever anyone's, anyone's sitting. Thank you. Um. I just put this in um, because in my travels talking to practices, there's been some concern about waiting times for colonoscopy and how we can meet that demand. Um, so part of our Ministry of Health readiness assessment has been that we had to prove we could meet mm -hmm. the current demand and it's been over the past 12 months they've been looking at that. Uh, and at the moment they are obviously happy with that because we've passed our readiness. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show you guys how we came to do that. Um, so the, at Whangarei Hospital here, we've got our new endoscopy suite, and that opened in May 2020. Um, so we've got increased rooms for procedures, and uh, Kaitai is also about to have a refit. Um, Deandra and I have spent a little bit of time recently working in the suite, mm -hmm. and it's awesome. I, I'm very impressed by it. it. Everything flows well, and the patients are super looked after, 
Um, they've got two theatres that run there, so it just goes like clockwork. So I've got every faith that they're going to do their part um, well above what we expect. Um, and obviously we're recruiting currently for more endoscopists and endoscopy nurses for Whangarei and Kaitaia. And we're also using a lot of locums as well, to, so there is no um, spare gaps. So, um, yeah, so we are in, um, be able to uh, meet, uh, over exceed the uh, demands of colonoscopies. Yeah, so that's a snapshot there, kind of where we're at. Um, you'll see on the end there, September 21. So the blue line is our P1s, our mm -hmm. urgent cases. Um, and as you can see, we've always been pretty good at getting those done. Mm -hmm. um, the P2 is the next level of not, not so urgent. Um, and as you can see, we've over time been getting that down um, as well. And then our P3, which is our surveillance ones, um, you can see there we've been putting in lots of mm. lots of mahi to get that down as well so going forward we should have plenty of capacity i've just put a little list on the bottom there of kind of ways that we've addressed that and so how we've managed to get that down and that's been things like the mobile bus um using the kensington hospital doing weekends evenings um, like deandra said we've had visiting endoscopists um the aim is to have no vacant lists and yeah, just drawing on resources to um, like Kaitaia, uh, where we can get some more through. So it's all looking good. Mm. These are just a couple of snapshots of the resources. Um, so there is pamphlets and they come in a range of languages. There's posters. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, all available on Health Ed, which is the same place that you guys get like your COPD and diabetes pamphlets and all of that. Um, so you can go on there and create an account and they will send them out to you. Or if that doesn't work for some reason, just let me know and I can get some out to you as well. So um, basically the resources we've got is the Healthcare Providers Guide, which I showed you earlier in the presentation. And then we've got our range of national resources and we'll hopefully have soon some localised stuff as well. Uh, and our health pathways, of course, is up and running as well. And yeah, that's basically um, our list of references for you guys to have a browse through that time to screen website, the National Screening Unit. That's a really, really good place for information uh, and it's sort of geared at patients as well, so it's easy to understand. Um, you should find lots on there. There's a little bit um, we've touched on here about um, Dr. Moya Nama's research around the equity um, bowel screening for Māori and Te Tai Taukura. Um, yeah, just a little bit more information if you wanted to know. And I'll just leave that slide up there for a minute. That's got our contact details for the um, everyone in the team and our email address. Uh, we've got that 0800 number as well, which you can call um, if you have any questions. And I think that's about it. Does anyone have any questions for us? Certainly. <laughs> Kia ora, Alistair. Kia ora. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, I understand that the practice will be notified if the test is positive, uh, but the program notifies the patient if the test is negative. But will the practice still be advised of a negative test so we can have that on our records? Yes, absolutely. That will come into your inbox just the same as a positive, but you're just not expected to relay that to the patient. And if the patient receives the test kit in the mail and sends back a form that says that they do not have a GP, what do you do? So um, if, if they don't have a GP, then we have a, the bowel screening register has a series of tasks and it will, uh, will show up that um, the patient has returned a kit um, and we don't have, we haven't received, if it's a positive result, we haven't received uh, the referral in the DHB within the 10 days. So that will flag mm. um, in the bowel screening register. So then we contact the patient. If there's no, if there's no GP, then we'll try and go find out where the contact has, whether 
patient, if there's any NHI contact or goes through all sorts of um, other angles to try and, or other avenues, I should say, to try and find that person and encourage them to register with a GP if they're not. Because yeah. some of them are registered um, in North and some some people who live at her domicile up here live in live in counties, for example. So it may be that their that their GP needs to send a paper referral through, which we organise with them. So um, that because we have it up there as a as a result, we have to do something with that mm. and um, and generally try and track down the patient. If the patient really doesn't want to have a GP, mm. then um, we can generate a referral ourselves. Deandra will will do that, and then they can still have a colonoscopy. Um, but it just you know it's a, it's a, a lot harder um, as far as the system goes. Well, I just wanted to sort of form they they filled in it had a slot for. Uh, identifying or naming who the GP is. You know, the, when it, when they put it in the post, like when they put their name and stuff on it? Um, yes, on the consent, on the consent form. form yeah. yeah, so um, they can uh, yeah. write on there if they have got a, if found a GP or have a GP, they can write there. And we do encourage people, everyone to check that those details are correct or if you've changed GPs or, you know, so there is on there, uh, all they have to do is date it peel off the barcode sticker and pop on the tube and check your GP details. So that is all in the instructions for the consent form. But obviously people don't read that so well. So it's a lot of education on our part as well. Yeah. And um, Deandra, I'm interested, uh, I'm just, I'm interested if you have a patient who is on aspirin or an anti-inflammatory or an anticoagulant, what, what's, the, uh, what's the procedure there? I'm curious to know. Yeah, sure. So uh, with aspirin, we don't get them to stop. Uh, they continue with that. Um, with, say, um, your antiplatelets or anticoagulants, it depends on what they're on, but we will stop, uh, say, for example, warfarin, we'll bridge uh, them if they're on warfarin. So we will get people to stop their anticoagulant or antiplatelets um, uh, because, there is a, because they've had a positive fit, there is a high risk that they have polyps. So we don't want them to repeat a bowel prep, so we will stop uh, all anticoagulants and antiplatelets, apart from aspirin, uh, just so that if they do find polyps, which a majority do, uh, they can remove them on that day, and that person doesn't have to repeat a bowel prep. Okay, so they don't have to do another test off, off the medication. You still go ahead and... Yeah, uh, well, we do test on the, yeah, so um, we do a point of care test on the day. So that's an endoscopy here. They've got a point of care test. And in Kai Tai, they've got the lab and they process them really quickly. So they'll have, they'll be able to um, check their INR. So um, that's all being sorted. With the bridging uh, with warfarin, uh, we do, we manage it until they get to the colonoscopy. Then after the colonoscopy, we do refer back to, we do ask that you take over their care right. uh, in terms of getting them back onto their warfarin. So bridging them from the clexane back onto warfarin. Thank you. And with the payment for the consultation, um, is, that, is that regardless whether it's face-to-face -face or, or by phone or Zoom or however it's done? Yeah. Yeah, mm, absolutely. Yeah. $60 every referral, whether it's an information referral or just an ordinary referral, mm. still get paid. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Good question. Mm. Give us another, somebody else here. Anyone else have uh, any questions? There's no written. Uh, I, I just want to know, on the dashboard, it's coming up about geocoding and what concerns me is the geocoding for some of our patients that live quite rural or on whānau land or um, are more disadvantaged, in fact, it's saying it can't go on the bowel program because they've got no geocode. What says that? On the dashboard. On the dashboard, it said it can't be put onto national program because they don't have a geocode. Uh, Polly, can I just interrupt there? Sorry. It's oh. Tanya here. Oh, um, Tula, Tanya, it's Jax. Oh, sorry, Jack. Um, it's actually because it hasn't gone live yet. So even though you can see it on the dashboard, the patient dashboard, yeah. it yeah. won't show unless it's got a Northland um, code um, for the when it goes live. But I do hear what you're saying about the um, if you're unable to geocode and it won't have a Northland code there. Mm -hmm. So 
but at the moment you can't test it because it's Just not live. It's live, is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. And cool. Is that as what, you girls understand it? Um, what we do as well as follow it up with Ken Leach and, and come back with an yeah, that yeah, yeah. The range it was the same. We'll follow it up with Ken Leach mm -hmm. um, and just check that. Thank um, you for putting that out. Well, Ken actually told me that because um, I've been in touch with him that it, it will only if you wanted to test it, you'd have to test it on a patient outside of Northland, like Mickey Mouse or something like that. That's not geocoded to Northland. Mm -hmm. But what we didn't cover was if they don't have a geocode at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we do have patients like that are living in a yes. tent in, yeah. on their own whānau land. We've got quite a few patients like that. Does that mean okay. they won't be included? So is that something you're going oh, on the dashboard? So they, they'll still be. Yeah, it just it just won't right. show on the dashboard. But I'm not sure how it will go um, in terms of um, actually completing the form because Ken made reference to the fact that it had to be the the um, Northland um, DHB area code. Mm -hmm. You know, even when we're doing referrals for healthy homes and some of them, like, um, out towards Rafferty, along that coast, it, that, that always, yeah, cut it to, it always comes up, no geocoding available. And will it let you complete those referrals, Polly? Usually we just, sorry, it's Jackie, and usually we just ring and do it manually to try and get it through. So it may be the same issue here because Tanya's saying the patient has to be identified as living in the Northland Rohi for it to go through. Yes, that's right. Um, otherwise, you'd get people from outside of the area you're being able to refer them, yeah. you know, so. So what do we do? Just wait to see. Um, um, well, I'm not sure that Ken's able to fix that because um, that's a geocoding issue and we've got quite a number of um, practices that are unable to geocode patients for lots of different reasons, you know, whether they be, you know, they're, um, quite rural or living on a yacht or something like that. So I'm not sure how we're going to get around that. Yeah, see, they'll still get screened, I guess. It's just the, the dashboard that won't yeah. work. Uh, well, you won't be able to do the referral, though. Yeah. Um, um, so we'll check we out if there's a manual to. referral system then. Yeah. Uh, how, how many, if you're saying that's quite a common thing for all of those patients who live so rural, what do they do for other referrals? Mm. Like, how would they um, refer for a colonoscopy? Mm. I'm not sure how it goes in practice. Um, Jackie, are you able to? Link. We can get it past health link, but it's just certain things. And it will tell us the geo. It's code. unusual because mm -hmm. Di Davis, um, it's not something that Di raised. Our referral is through health link. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but that's after it comes back positive, eh? Yeah, so all the ref all the positive people mm -hmm. will be referred. Um, so that's the only ones we want, mm -hmm. really, for a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is it imperative they have a geocode for their kits to go out? Mm. No, because it's generated off the NHI and the NES yeah. system. So if, oh, they've okay. presented, yeah. if they're presented to ED or something, then that would all be updated. Mm. Um, okay. yeah. so that's the kind of information source mm. for that. Mm. Okay, thank you. Interesting though, and I'd be keen to know if you know, if you have one of those and you're having trouble with it, just, yeah, please let us know and we'll tease it out and get it sorted as soon as we can. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is good. Yeah. Thanks, Jackie. Okay. That was me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> is there any other questions? Um, I had a... Um, a bit of feedback from one of the Northland practices saying they're really keen to start um, advertising to their patients now, sort of pre-warning them that this is coming up. Yep. Right, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Yep, do they need some pamphlets and things or, you know, let us know. Jess, Jess is happy to support with, with information that they might need. That's, that's okay. really good. All right, I'll give you a call.
Yes. Yeah. Thinking, or if they have a Facebook page mm -hmm. or a website or the um, Health TV or anything like that, Tanya, let us know and we'll see what we can get mm. to them. Awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Is that, is that it for questions? All right. Yep. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much to Jess for a great mm -hmm. effort, uh, great presentation and setting it up. Mm -hmm. um, great questions. And, you know, we're just going to let, because Jess organised all mm -hmm. this, we're going to let her finish off with her closing karakia. Kia ora. <laughs> Kia whakaerea, te tapu, kia wātea, ai te ara, kia tūruki, whakataha ai, kia tūruki, whakataha ai, pāmi e, nui e, tāu. Thank you. Kia ora, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Carolyn, can you send yeah. that to me and I can send it out to everybody tomorrow after our next presentation, please? Yep, sure. Hello. Um, can we have, yeah. We'll record tonight's as well and see if there's any tweaks we need to make mm. to the presentation.